from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome. Welcome to the Library of Congress and a special welcome to the, um, on behalf of the John W. Kluge Center Fellows Lecture Series. The Kluge Center at the Library of Congress hosts several fellows throughout the year and many of our speakers are here, many of our future potential speakers, all the bright young minds, um, are actually here in the audience today um, <clears throat> as they've been in residence for several months. Our speaker today is Daniel Brook, an architecture and design writer journalist and a fellow of the Black Mountain Institute based in Las Vegas and has been in residence here at the John Kluge Center for the past several months. Daniel is a graduate of Yale University and has since written essays and commentaries in periodicals such as the Harper's Magazine, The Nation Magazine, Slate, and The Washington Post, among others. His essays on politics, culture, um, politics, culture, economy, and architecture have won him numerous writing awards, including most recently the Winter House Award for design criticism and writing. His first book, Trap, Selling Out to Stay Afloat in Winner-Take-All America, chronicles the difficult personal and ethical choices faced by many bright and young Americans as they move from college to their workplace choices. Through a combination of personal interviews and economic and political analyses, Daniel captures the trap that many uh, promising Americans find themselves in between ideals, desires, and social trends. As everyone who has had the opportunity to meet Daniel here at the Kluge Center, <clears throat> at the Kluge Center will know he has the rare skill to see, experience, and view America from both the inside and the outside. <clears throat> he somehow manages to maintain the freshness of an outsider with all the familiarity of an insider, an insight that he brings to all of his writing. Unfortunately for him, it has also meant that here at the Kluge Center, he's our local tour guide for all the international scholars, everywhere from uh, the IHOP to basketball games and everything else. And we're not in bad company, actually, especially if we look at his writing here. One of his recent essays uh, in the Harper's Magazine, the short essay um, a couple of years ago, in which he gives us a wonderful account of the architectural developments around the mall in, Amer uh, mall in Washington, D.C., um, which would be interesting to read even for the casual visitor um, to Washington, D.C. But it is also a, te a telling example of what he manages to capture through his writing. The essay, while describing uh, the intricate details, or the, uh, while he <coughs> the essay while describing the architectural and design elements of the several new federal buildings around the mall, um, also very interestingly captures the changing nature of government in the 21st century. And that's something he captures, he manages to capture when he looks at the built environment in cities, uh, architectural elements, but what they tell us about the changing nature of politics and governance in our society in the 21st century. Daniel Brooks' next project, next book project, due out from W.W. W. Norton in 2012, once again gives us that unique combination of the outsider-insider lens through a, a much larger global and historical scale. <clears throat> He's taking He's taking the same orientation to chronicling the story of the West, um, into chronicling the story of, West, of the West as it can be told through the architectural history of cities such as Shanghai, Mumbai, Dubai, St. Petersburg, and uh, just to name a few. In today's talk, Daniel will be focusing on a very different sort of a tale of two cities, that of Shanghai uh, in China and Mumbai in uh, India, as uh, uh, the two cities, uh, as, as the two cities at the leading edge of Asian modernity in the 21st century, the tale of these two cities and how they negotiate their hybrid Western, non-Western identities is more than just the history of any particular building or even the city, but perhaps more importantly, as Daniel shows us, he offers us a window into nationalism, into civilization, and globalization as seen from the Asian perspective. Daniel Brooks' talk today is titled Building Modern Minorities, Model Modernities in Shanghai and Mumbai. Please join me in, join me in welcoming Daniel Brook. Thank you so much, Chris, for introducing me. That was an incredibly generous introduction. Uh, one of the wonderful things about being at the Kluge Center has been interacting with my fellow fellows. 
Um, Chris, as a historian of India, has been particularly helpful. Um, certainly his stamp is going to be on the Mumbai sections of the book in that. I've been able to ask Chris off the cuff, oh, what should I read about um, Raj era economic history? And he knows, you know, he gives me the 10 best sources and tells me exactly what to read and, and it's been a huge help. That said, all the fellows, um, so many of us are working on similar topics or at least topics that overlap in terms of uh, post-colonialism and nationalism and uh, the world we find ourselves in today, um, that it's really been a, a pleasure to uh, work with all of you. Additionally, um, Dr. Carolyn Brown and Mary Lou Reeker and the entire staff of the Kluge Center has been uh, nothing but helpful. Um, and they've created a space where scholarship is honored, uh, which I think is, uh, is much needed and much appreciated. Um, I invited uh, a bunch of people to come, some of them from civilians from beyond the library. Um, some thankfully did. Um, but one said, uh, Dan, it's, it's Wednesday at noon. Some of us work for a living. Um, and the idea that what we do is work, um, even if it's a labor of love, which it is, definitely have massive crushes on Shanghai and Mumbai, um, but it is still labor as well. Uh, so it's nice that that is honored. To begin my lecture, I want to disorient you. Um, orient is a noun and a verb. Uh, it means east, the noun. It's also the verb uh, to find yourself in space, um, in, in urban space. And the reason it's both a noun and a verb is when you talk about uh, buildings used to be oriented based on where the sun rises in the east. If you didn't know where you were, you would look at the sun. So they are, they are from the same root. And in a sense, both uh, Shanghai and Mumbai are disorienting metropolises. They don't look like what you'd imagine they would look like if you've never been to them. And, and I know most of you, some of you have been fortunate enough to have experienced these cities, but most of you haven't. So I just want to shake you up a little bit and disorient you and give you a, a crash course in Mumbai and Shanghai before pulling back and giving you the history and the context to understand what's going on in these cities. Uh, this is not uh, Oxford or Cambridge with a palm tree photoshopped in. Uh, this is the University of Bombay. This is the Bombay Gym Club, uh, not a gym club in Britain, uh, and these are Indians playing cricket. This double-decker bus passing the spires of Neo-Gothic High Street uh, is in Mumbai, India. And finally, this is a sign for uh, form, what was formerly known as the Victoria Terminus, now called uh, the Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminus, the main train station in Mumbai, which I will discuss. Um, and as some of the, the Londoners can see, the India railway system still uses the London tube signage for all of its graphic design. Finally, uh, this is an Art Deco movie palace that is not in Los Angeles, California, but rather in Mumbai, India. Uh, now to my favorite apartment building in Washington, D.C., which happens to be in Shanghai. Uh, I think we could, have, we could bring a few architectural historians in, and I think they could have a real big fight about whether this building is in Cleveland Park or Woodley Park. Um, but actually, it's in the French concession of Shanghai, designed by a British architect based in Hong Kong. Again, two more images of that building. This is not my favorite hotel in New York, nor is it my favorite hotel in Chicago. It's my favorite hotel in Shanghai, China. This is not the White House, although <laughs> I think uh, if this got into the right-wing blogosphere, they'd have proof that Obama really is a communist. Um, this is the uh, French Ministry of Industry from Shanghai. What to make of all of this? These cities develop more or less in lockstep, kind of shockingly in lockstep. Uh, and I'm going to trace them through four periods. The first is the late 19th century, when they're both built. Uh, as you can see, built using imported Western architects and Western architectural forms, but built for different purposes. Shanghai is built as what the uh, Shanghailanders, as they cleverly call themselves, the, the Western uh, residents of Shanghai, they build it as their Eastern home. So they build these replicas of home to make them feel more uh, like they're, they're less estranged from their homelands. Mumbai in this period is built as a didactic metropolis. It's built as a, an image of a modern city to win the hearts and minds of the Indian residents in general and 
to build an Anglophone Indian elite in particular. And yet they both use similar forms. Then in the early 20th century, uh, both, in both cities you see the rise of uh, an indigenous Chinese elite and an indigenous Indian elite. There's more and more power with the locals and there are different architectural responses to this. You'll see more and more uh, of the indigenous traditions being integrated into the architecture of the two cities. Then in 1947 and 1949 respectively, um, you have independence in India and the communist revolution in China. And during the Cold War decades, both cities, because they don't fit the nationalist narratives of, of either the Indian Congress Party founded in Bombay in 1885 or the Chinese Communist Party founded in Shanghai in 1921, because they don't fit the nationalist narrative, they're both stifled purposefully and very little is built, which is a blessing and a curse or a curse and a blessing in that so much of what we see here from uh, my photos is still there on the ground today. And then finally, um, beginning in 1990, in Shanghai in 1991 in Mumbai, for reasons I will explain, both reintegrate with the global economy and experience the building booms that are still currently going on in each city. And I'll show you a few samples of uh, projects from those cities and make, make an argument that in the past 20 years, um, the development or the, uh, the questions of modernity have not been answered as fully or as interestingly as they were in the 1920s and 30s in these very same places. Uh, this is a population density map of China and a circle around Shanghai. For those of you who are not aware, Shanghai is on the east coast of China. It is where the uh, a tributary of the Yangtze meets the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the Yangtze River, uh, both in the mid-19th century and today, is home to one-tenth of the world's population. When uh, Hugh Lindsay of the British East India Company observes Shanghai in 1932, it's a regional market town with some international commerce, he realizes that, uh, quote, the advantage to the British should we secure this port are incalculable. In 1842, 10 years later, the British do secure the port of Shanghai uh, after the Opium War. The Chinese emperor tries to outlaw opium. In response, the Royal Navy makes war on him and signs the Treaty of Nanking, the first of the so-called unequal treaties, uh, which gives the British and then later the other Western powers who sign further unequal treaties, including the United States and France, uh, concessions in five treaty ports, including Shanghai. I apologize, this is an old image, and I haven't been able to find a good version of it, but it's still an important image. Around the Shanghai walled city, which is the, the regional market town, the imperial powers build concessions. Um, there's nothing in any of the unequal treaties that gives them actual power over any Chinese land. What they do get is the principle of extraterritoriality, which means the members of the treaty uh, countries, the signatories of the treaty, so British subjects, French citizens, and American citizens, and later citizens of other uh, nations, can live in China without abiding by Chinese law. Uh, in, this, in this treaty port, they're allowed to live year-round, unlike in Canton, where they had a trading season. Uh, and they're ultimately, they, with the weakness of the imperial government, set up their own governments, including an all-white Shanghai Municipal Council, which runs the uh, English and American settlement, which merge into the international settlement, and a French Municipal Council to run the French concession. Um, so in this map, uh, the reason I show it is, is the three amoebas. Uh, the sort of amoebic form at the far right is, the, is labeled American ground, then the large one in the center, uh, English ground, and then the small one, next to that French ground. And now in a better map, uh, these concessions last about 100 years. Um, you have a map from 1931, which shows how they've grown. You have foreign settlement, which is the Anglo-American colony. Uh, you see the French concession has grown. It's now kind of enveloped the Chinese city. Um, and these uh, endure until the Japanese invasion uh, right before World War II. The city that's created through extraterritoriality is a very unusual one in that groups from all over the world, really all over the world, not just Britain, France, and, and America, but by the 1870 census, the international settlement shows uh, 20 nationalities, including Mexicans and Malays and Greeks and Swedes and all sorts of, everybody kind of comes there to trade uh, at this key trading city. Um, creates a, a, hybrid con a hybrid city where uh, the lingua franca is pidgin English, which is a mix of uh, Chinese grammar, 
English vocabulary sprinkling of uh, Hindi and Portuguese and other languages. Uh, we still have some remnants of it in the English phrase no can do or chop chop, uh, but mostly it died out with the communist revolution. And here each uh, country begins to build their version of home. So this is an early uh, image of the bund, which is uh, a Hindi word or a pidgin Shanghainese word uh, meaning embankment. This is uh, what becomes the riverfront uh, where the British build their trading houses, uh, or not just the British, the British, the, the Germans, uh, etc. And this is a very early image. You see uh, at the far left the Imperial Customs House in the Chinese form, uh, which is later taken over by the British and administered on the Emperor's behalf, uh, and eventually uh, is rebuilt first as something that looks like a British church and then something that looks like a Chicago skyscraper. Um, and then you have these compradoric forms, they're called. They're based on what was built in Canton with these uh, verandas. The idea being uh, that you know, we're in the tropics, so we need to have our gin and tonic on the veranda, which makes perfect sense in Canton, which has a climate like Miami. Uh, after a few years, they realize Shanghai has a climate like Washington, DC, and you have days like today when a gin and tonic on the veranda would not be advisable. Um, so each, every few years, they, build, they rebuild the bun grander and grander and grander. And what we're left with uh, today is, or what we're left with at World War II, which thankfully is still preserved, is what at this point is the, is the world's greatest jazz age skyline that's still extant. Um, so at the far left, we have the headquarters of the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, which was a company founded by British merchants in Bombay to deal with the China trade. We know it better as HSBC. Uh, then you have this uh, Imperial Customs House uh, right next to it with the big Qing clock tower. Uh, and then over at the far end, we have this pyramid-shaped hotel, uh, the Cafe Hotel, which I will get into later from 1929. Just want to give you a sample of each country building their own home. Uh, this is a, a Parisian style building. The French plant their concession with sycamore trees, uh, just like they planted Paris. Uh, the Americans, this is the Shanghai American School. Uh, looks like, uh, we call, uh, ironically, we call this style colonial revival. Here it's the former colony becoming the imperial power. Um, but it's, it's the kind of building you would find in Boston or Philadelphia with this uh, the red brick and the, the little colonial cupola. Uh, this uh, is a single family house of the type you would find in actually a lot where I grew up on Long Island or suburban Los Angeles. Um, and just like where I grew up on Long Island, it was built by an American real estate developer in the 1920s. So it makes perfect sense. Um, although designed by a Hungarian architect who's a, a real great Shanghailander character who we'll learn more about later. This is from a 1903 uh, tour guide to Shanghai. It's an ad. And this gives you a sense of how each country is bringing their world to Shanghai. This is the Getz Brothers and Company department store main office, San Francisco, USA, you see in the upper corner. And it promises you a complete line of American products and manufacturers. So you can go there to get your Levi's jeans and your Heinz ketchup. Uh, if you're British, you can go to Hall and Holtz department store, which promises it in an ad from this era to give you everything you need to have a Christmas just like home in England with your Yorkshire puddings and other obscure delicacies, which I've never been initiated into. The settlements are built as initially segregated, residentially segregated settlements. Uh, segregation breaks down almost immediately. They're founded in, the, in 1842. In the 1850s, the Taiping Rebellion breaks out in the mainland of China. And because of the instability, uh, the, the, the concessions get flooded with Chinese refugees. Initially, both the imperial Chinese government and the concession governments try to maintain segregation. They knock down shanty towns. They try to corral people to one side or the other. But soon the Shanghailanders realize they can make a lot of money being slumlords to the Chinese. And from the 1850s until the 1940s, the foreign concessions, foreign concessions are majority Chinese. And it creates this crucible of Chinese modernity where you have Chinese villagers exposed to the, the, the most technologically sophisticated uh, developments that are, you find in France or Britain or the United States. This is an image from Harper's Weekly from, 18, from the 1870s showing Derby Day, which was almost the, 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 ma the main civic holiday of the, of the semi-colonial Shanghai, in that the Americans would celebrate July 4th, the, Brit the French would do July 14th, the British would celebrate Victoria's birthday. The one thing they had in common was the Derby, which was held at the Shanghai Race Club, which was uh, indeed racially restricted, pun very much intended. Um, and yet, 
you see in this image, uh, this is riding through the Chinese, the walled Chinese city you can see from the architecture, uh, the Chinese sort of craning their necks to see uh, what's going on. You have a, a, in, in one corner, you have a man selling treats. Here you have a white man on a horse. Uh, you have a mix of uh, Chinese, you, you have, you have um, Chinese riding a carriage as well. So you get this sense of how this, this, col this colony is unintentionally shaking up China by creating uh, a, a new world on Chinese soil, but not of it. The Chinese themselves end up, in the concessions, end up living in a unique form of housing that exists only in Shanghai. In, in the same way, I would argue, this, these sort of Shanghai Chinese are a kind of person that exists only in Shanghai. Um, on the outs they, they combine uh, sort of British row house architecture with Chinese, traditional Chinese urbanism. So um, in, a, in a traditional Chinese city like Beijing, you have something called hutong, which are they're, they're alley compounds. So they're, they're walled off from the street by gates like this, although they don't have French writing on them. Um, but they're, uh, it's a series of courtyard houses, and then there are alleys that are pulled back from the street. So it creates this kind of traditional Chinese urbanism. Here in Shanghai, you get the Lilong, which have, here's a, I apologize, I'm a better writer than photographer, but you do get a sense here in this alley uh, that it is an alley. It's close to traffic, unlike in a, a British row house, would, this would be fronting the street. Um, this, incidentally, this, this Lilong was financed by Citibank, um, which is now a big player in Shanghai real estate again. Uh, but here you get a sense from above of uh, this, this, this British row house on a Chinese alley. So the, the streets, at the big street is a traffic street, and then these, uh, these intermediate streets are, are close to, to traffic. And the issue becomes what, what does this city mean to the people who live here, um, who in some ways, are, as, as the time develops, are more and more integrated into the city. At the same time, even in 1934, the life expectancy for a Chinese person in Shanghai is 27 years old. Um, so there you have the, the sort of nose pressed to the glass of modernity, the mix of excitement and humiliation that uh, China is still coming to terms with today. Now I'd like to describe the origins of Mumbai. Um, Mumbai is on the Arabian Sea on the west coast of India. Uh, it was initially an archipelago. Uh, the Portuguese decided it, was, it would be a good bay, so they named it Bombaya, meaning good bay. Uh, it's seated in the late 1600s in a royal dowry to the British, who in turn lease it to the British East India Company, who turn it into a port where they will uh, export the riches of the subcontinent uh, to Europe. This is the original, this shows the original archipelago and then how the British turned it in from an archipelago into one giant island through landfill reclamation. Uh, Mumbai novelist Salman Rushdie uh, refers to it as a, an outstretched hand grasping westward, uh, which is why he's Salman Rushdie and I'm not. Uh, the fort, uh, each British East India Company uh, town is built around a fort. Um, in most of their developments, uh, for example, Madras or Calcutta, the fort is completely segregated. Um, in Mumbai, it never is. It's always, there's a street in the middle and from one side down is all white, and from one side up is anyone can live. Uh, so this fort uh, becomes over 40% Parsi, which is a sort of key diaspora group in Bombay. They're Persian Zoroastrians who are pushed out of Persia in the 1300s by uh, the Muslim rulers of Persia and settle in India and eventually group uh, heavily in uh, what is then Bombay, now Mumbai. Uh, up to the right, you see the label native town uh, which is, in this case, kind of funny because they have Parsis in the fort. Um, but that's where most of the communities live. And the British have engineered this city such that there are representatives of every Indian community in that if you want teakwood, which they want, you need Keralites to bring up the teakwood from the south. If you want gems, you need Gujaratis to bring the gems down from the north. So they create a, an incredibly cosmopolitan metropolis uh, such that a, a French visitor who arrives in 1860 says he feels in the, in the markets of Mumbai, or Bombay then, he feels like he's at the Tower of Babel. Um, and yet the city is initially just this fort. Uh, British East India Company rule uh, breaks down with the uh, uprising of 1857, uh, which takes place mostly in uh, eastern India around Calcutta. In place of the British East India Company, which has now discredited its rule, Parliament and Queen Victoria uh, decide they will rule the colony 
uh, themselves. Uh, this is the era known as the British Raj. The proclamation of Queen Victoria is read from the town hall steps in the fort, promising religious tolerance and uh, what we would now call economic development, but what is known in Victorian times as progress. Uh, the first Raj era governor, Sir Bartle Frere, decides he will rebuild, he will tear down the fort walls, create a ramparts removal committee, capital R, capital R, C, with his uh, favorite architects from London, and he will build, uh, rebuild uh, Bombay as the herbs prima in Indus, uh, the first city of India. He envisions it as, quite simply, the leading city in the leading colony in the leading empire in the history of the world. How does one build a modern city? Uh, for Sir Bartle Frere, he sits down and makes a list of institutions that every moder modern city needs to have. He comes up with about a dozen things like a university and a telegraph office and a public works department and a hospital. Then he removes the fort walls and builds a row of these modern institutions along what becomes a, the main public park of Bombay. Uh, this image here shows a very, is a very early, uh, maybe 1870s image, uh, showing these Victorian Gothic buildings rising uh, along where the fort walls once stood in Bombay. For the University of Bombay, he taps uh, Sir Gilbert Scott, who's at that time the leading British uh, Gothic revival architect who's already done buildings at both Oxford and Cambridge, so seems like a perfectly good choice. Um, Sir Gilbert Scott decides that um, since Italy is sunny and India is sunny too, maybe we should build Italian Gothic in India. So he bases his designs, uh, this, this tower, the Campanile, is based on an unbuilt uh, design by Giotto, the Italian Renaissance architect for Florence, and the uh, Convocation Hall um, at the left of the screen um, is based in part on the Doge's Palace in Venice. He designs the buildings at his studio in London and then mails them to Bombay. He never sets foot in India. This is uh, the elevation on the Convocation Hall. And this is a comparison with the Doge's Palace in Venice. There are a few edits that he's made. The most significant is uh, the arch at the top um, of, of the, uh, the, the, these main arches. Um, on the, in the Doge's Palace, it's called an, it's called an OG arch. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's an S-shaped, sort of sensuous S-shaped form. Whereas in Bombay University, he's popped it out into a, a typical uh, concave Gothic arch form. And architectural historians think what he's doing here is he's decided that the Doge's Palace in Venice is too Eastern and too Islamic with this sensuous, you have to give them a pure European Gothic arch uh, in order to inculcate our European Western values, which is what the university uh, is intended to do. So, I mean, you could write a whole dissertation just on, on this, um, but just to throw a few things out there. I mean, the idea that um, East makes West, that it's the encounter with uh, the East that, that sort of pushes the West back on its heels and makes it wonder, well, oh, well what, what, who are we and, and what makes us Western? So here you have this kind of purified vision of the West. Um, and this denial that, that uh, Europe and the Islamic world have been you know, trading in, in, and were for, for hundreds of years as well. If the university is one of the first uh, of, the, of the great Victorian Gothic buildings of Bombay, uh, the Victoria Terminus Rail Station uh, is, is the last. This is built in, in the 1880s. It's designed by Frederick William Stevens, who's uh, an architect from Bath, England, who moves to Bombay uh, when he's uh, about 20 years old and works in the public works department for the rest of his career. Um, he, when he got this commission, he went back to London and looked at St. Pancras, Sir Gilbert Scott's uh, rail station, which had just opened, uh, and comes up with a, a plan very similar. Um, and, and also a form very similar. They both combine uh, an office for the railway company uh, with you know, ticket booths and, and the station itself, um, and obviously ecclesi ecclesiastical forms. Uh, that said, Queen Victoria has promised not to convert the natives. So this is not, this is not trying to, this is not, a, but, but this is not a Christian church, but it is, I would argue, a church in its own, in its own right. Um, at the top of the dome is, uh, unlike, say, in Rio, you have Jesus standing over the city in an Iberian colony trying to convert the people. Uh, here over Bombay, you don't have Jesus. You have the uh, embodiment of, of progress, this goddess of progress with her wheel and her torch. So the, the, wheel, the wheel and fire, the first two great uh, human um, uh, um, breakthroughs, scientific breakthroughs. 
Um, and under her, of course, she has, you, you have the uh, ticket office, which looks like a church, but in place of confessional booths, you have the ticket booth. So in some ways, this is like the people's university. You have the university, which trains this Anglophone elite. And then you have the train station, where the, the regular masses of Bombay are converted to the real religion of the West, which is the progress. Stained glass windows, but uh, they threw a cross and they couldn't help themselves. But um, it's not, you see, it's, it's actually the great Indian Peninsula Railway Company seal. Uh, and then their Latin uh, motto, which is arte non ensa, which means by art or skill, not by the sword. Um, this could be the motto of the Raj, which is, you know, in the mutiny, uh, we ruled India by, by force. And on, right before uh, Bombay is, is rebuilt, there's an execution on the esplanade where, where one Muslim and one uh, Hindu upriser are tied to cannons and executed. Uh, so the Raj will not rule India by terror, but rather by progress, by showing, by economic development. Uh, and here in the details of the stained glass window, you have the elephant, which is a symbol of India's, uh, both its grandeur and its backwardness. This is the, the, the old form of transportation, which was beautiful but inefficient. And then the railroad, uh, the locomotive, which the British uh, have given India, which, you know, even if it lacks the grace of the elephant, makes up for it in its efficiency and progress. As in Shanghai, uh, Mumbai develops its own unique form of worker housing that exists nowhere else in India. Uh, it's called the Trawl, um, and it's a, sort of a Western tenement building, uh, but built by uh, Indian workmen, and you end up getting these um, these lattice work windows. Uh, this is this is all the same building. Um, and you get these, this entryway with the Mughal arch carving, um, and in the the chals, the conditions are very much like in the Lelongs. You have between five and ten men living in each of these tiny rooms. Ideally, ten by twelve. That's when the uh, improvement trust builds them. That's when the government that's trying to improve the slums builds them. When they're built by private industry, not even necessarily uh, ten by twelve. Uh, you have dock workers in in Mumbai who. Their average tenure of service is 10 years before they, they give out. So again, you have the sense of uh, the Indians are exposed to an incredibly modern city, um, and at the same time, are in, in many ways second. Many of them are second-class citizens within it. Okay, now early 20th century Shanghai. I want to do a number of responses uh, from the Chinese and then from the Indians. This is the first. These, this is uh, on the right is the sincere department store. On the left is the Wing On department store. Uh, these are both founded by Cantonese families. Cantonese are in some ways like the, the Parsis of, of Shanghai. Canton is southern China, uh, but you get this diaspora, I mean you have Cantonese diaspora in Chinatown on 7th Street here, all over the world, including in Shanghai. Um, they create these, these department stores, which uh, architecturally look very much like a Western department store, and they're, they're built for westernized wealthy Chinese to shop in them. That said, there are some interesting um, indigenous elements. This is, a, of course, a, a day image. Um, but at night, you can see the, the little lightning uh, under, under the tower, uh, for example, on Sincere. You see the Chinese writing on these little lightning um, things. At night, those are lit up. And this aesthetic of the sort of neon flashing, which we think of, um, ironically, as Korean or Japanese because of because Korea and Japan are such wealthy countries, actually starts on Nanjing Road in, in Shanghai. So, so it brings in what, what we now think of as like the quintessential uh, East Asian uh, urban aesthetic. All, all begins right here. Additionally, in this period, the sort of top-down Western over, over Asian uh, system is being changed by world events. Um, in 1917, in addition to Wing On being founded, you have that other event called the Russian Revolution in Petrograd. And the city of Shanghai, because of its extraterritorial rules. Um, it's the most open city in the history of the world. You don't need a visa or passport to live in Shanghai. It's flooded with Russian refugees, many of whom are incredibly poor. So there are definitely homeless white men for the first time. There are definitely white prostitutes for the first time. And there are rumors, oh, that this is something historians debate, there might even have been white rickshaw pullers in Shanghai at this point. You also have the development uh, of Japan's rise as a power. So Japan ends up owning a lot of the factories. You have wealthy Japanese businessmen doing business in Shanghai, and the Japanese are given seats on the Shanghai Municipal Council, which was, had previously been all white. So it's now an all white and Japanese 
ruling body of the international settlement over the Chinese, uh, over the Chinese population. This is the Guo family that, that owns the, uh, the Wing On department store. This is their Tudor Manor. Uh, this is in the French concession. And you see they're completely dressed uh, in, in Western fashion. Um, so it sort of embodies, in many ways, the family embodies their store, or the store embodies the, the values of the family. That said, there's also a more uh, hybrid response, both in architecture and, and in fashion. Um, this is a cigarette ad. This is um, sometimes called the Shanghai Girl, sort of the Shanghai's version of a 1920s flapper. Um, and you can see here, the dress is called the Chi Pao. It, it's silk, and it uses uh, certain patterns that have antecedents uh, clearly in imperial Chinese fashion. But it's a Western dress that has this uh, uh, rather scandalous uh, adjustable um, slit in it. Uh, and you can see um, her hair is done in a perm, which is obviously a very de rigueur uh, Western uh, motif, uh, hairdo. She's smoking a cigarette, which at the time, also in the West, it's a big deal for women to smoke. She's showing you her, her unbound feet. Um, and she's doing all of this in front of the racetrack, which right around the time this ad is made is, is finally integrated. Um, so you see the, the, the hybridization and the rising status of the Chinese. Furthermore, the, the, this, this space in Shanghai for single uh, working women, uh, you know, sometimes as dancers, sometimes as secretaries, et cetera, is a space that doesn't exist in village China. Um, and they create a whole vocabulary to kind of deal with this, including uh, the, word, the word da ling, which means darling, because there, there's, no, there's no courtship in arranged marriages. So they, they create this whole, uh, this whole language for the city. Uh, the building, uh, there's buildings along the racetrack, right about 10 years afterwards, is replaced with, with this, which is uh, another uh, response to modernity. This is the tallest building in Europe or Asia when it's built. So here the response is, we're, we're just going to be modern. We're just going to be the best, most modern people we can be. We're going to build buildings that are taller than anything in London or Paris. And this building, the, the client, is the, the uh, Joint Savings Society, which is the leading Chinese-owned financial firm. So it's, it's their office and a hotel. Um, and to, to build this, they commission Laszlo Hudek, who's another one of these crazy Shanghailander characters. He's a, a Hungarian architect who trains in Budapest. Then in World War I, he's drafted. He's captured by the Russians and sent to a Siberian POW camp. He's then being transferred from one Siberian POW camp to another by train, hops the train near the, chi the Chinese border, and of course makes his way to Shanghai, where you don't need a passport or visa to enter. He marries a half-British, half-German woman, lives in the French concession in a Tudor home, and designs skyscrapers for Chinese clients. He described, designs single-family homes for American real estate developer clients, and is just living this kind of only in Shanghai, unplaceable English patient kind of life. 1927 to 37 is the nationalist period in China. The nationalist government has taken power vowing to uh, get rid of the foreign settlements, but once in power, realizes it's too dependent financially on this, this business hub to get rid of it. So instead, uh, in the Chinese part of, of Shanghai, they try to build an alternate downtown uh, using in Chinese style by a man named Dong Daiyu, who's a Chinese architect who trains at Columbia University in New York. Uh, this is the public library, uh, and it uses this, this, uh, this double roof structure is, is cribbed right off the drum tower in Beijing, which is uh, right near the, the Forbidden City. Uh, so it's a Western institution clothed in, in Chinese forms. Uh, incidentally, there's a little bit of Cultural Revolution graffiti on this defunct library that you can see uh, on, the, on the left. Uh, he also does a sports stadium, which is, uh, I guess, what the Ming Emperor would have built if the Ming Emperor built sports stadiums. Uh, it uses this uh, Chinese gate structure that you'll see in a, in a Ming city wall in any of the many uh, Chinese cities that have city walls from that era. Uh, as, its, as its gateway, but inside it's uh, a sports stadium where you can play volleyball or, or badminton. Then you have a, 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 this, this final response uh, uh, to Shanghai's uh, polyglot modernity. This is the Cathay Hotel, uh, which as you can see uh, in the photograph is an Art Deco uh, pyramid topped hotel that you could find in New York or Chicago. Um, in the ad on, at the right, it's uh, stacking it up with Paris, it's saying, it, along with the Eiffel Tower, it's the, one of the most interesting towers in the world. Um, and you're getting a confidence in Shanghai at this point. Um, it, this says, 
Shanghai, the Paris of the Orient. By this point, this is its typical moniker. But there's a, a British guidebook from this era that says, who's to say whether um, Shanghai is the Paris of the Orient or Paris is the Shanghai of the Occident? Um, and in terms of uh, its business prowess at this point, it, it has eclipsed Paris and Berlin. It's, it really is a New York, London, Shanghai world in terms of the, the, top, the top banking cities uh, in the, by the late 1920s. Now, inside this hotel, it's not what you expect. Um, there are nine different deluxe suites in the hotel, and each is done in the style of a different country. Uh, this is the Chinese suite, which uses these, these moon gates uh, between the different rooms. But if you don't want to stay in the Chinese suite, you can stay in the, uh, the British suite or the French suite, or if you're the Indian suite, where you can fix your hair in a, a Mughal-shaped uh, mirror and stand on an actual uh, rug imported from India. It's easy to dismiss this as proto-Vegas kitsch, um, and on some level it is, but it's also on some level much more interesting. The hotel um, is built by Sir Victor Sassoon, who is uh, the great-grandson of a Baghdadi, uh, a Baghdad Jew who moves to Bombay out of religious persecution. His sons then moved to Shanghai and set up a China trade um, between the two cities. So then you have uh, Sir Victor, um, who is and so grows up in Shanghai before going off to uh, Cambridge in Britain, has his cousins in Bombay, and at some level feels equally at home in all of these rooms. So here he, he's in some ways Chinese, in some ways Indian, in some ways British, in some ways none of these things. And in this hotel, I think you're getting the idea that Shanghai doesn't have to decide whether it's Western or non-Western. It can just be a global city and embrace the forms of all the world as it embraces the peoples of all the world. Of course, this world breaks down. Um, the Communist Party, which was founded in Shanghai, is routed uh, in a series of strikes and fights with the nationalists, becomes a peasant movement, uh, and then the People's Liberation Army of Peasants takes uh, Shanghai in 1949, uh, many of them completely perplexed by the city, like with its movie theaters and hotels and bars that they've never seen in their villages. Um, but as this uh, image makes clear, they don't wreck the city, they don't destroy the city, they just put red banners all over the city. So Sir Victor Sassoon's hotel just gets a red banner and is, is perfectly well preserved to this day. Um, the city is essentially frozen and we will pick the narrative back up when it, when it explodes again. Um, now to Mumbai, again you get these hybrid responses. This is also by, this is right across the street from Victoria Terminus, this is also by Frederick William Stevens. This is the Bombay Municipal Council. Uh, and you see at the bottom half of the building looks just like Victoria Terminus has, has these uh, Venetian Gothic forms and this, the archways in the carriageway have these uh, painted sort of in the Cordoba style. So there's just these little nods to the east. Then above, he's integrated minarets and dome forms from the Mughal palette um, of architecture. And this reflects what's just gone on in the Bombay Municipal Council, which is that the Indians have won much more representation on the, on the council. So it's, it's finally beginning to reflect, rather than this airlifted in from Europe look, uh, a more uh, more hybrid look. You get as well these um, British institutions housed entirely uh, by the early 20th century in Indian forms. This is the general post office of the city um, and inside you can do your stamps at an octagonal standard in, in, uh, uh, in marble like a Mughal emperor. Um, and here we have the idea that these institutions, yes maybe every city needs a post office, but the post office doesn't necessarily have to look like the post office in London. Maybe it will look like this. Asian modernity need not look like Western modernity. Um, finally, here, here's a much like a wing on department store. This is an integrated club called the Willingdon Club. It looks very much uh, like a British club and this, the, the traffic was bad when I got there, the sun was setting, so, uh, or my beer on the lawn and the, with the white chairs, you don't have such a great view, but that's what's going on. And uh, it's just an integrated club. It looks very much like a British club. And I had a wonderful conversation here with the uh, middle-aged woman who got me in. It was a friend's boss, and she says, oh, you're writing a book, what, what is that about? And I tell her, and she says, oh, my dad's from Shanghai. He's a, a Bombay Parsi who, he's 90 years old. He was bo born in, in Shanghai in 1920, and he lived there till the communist revolution. And now we're pen pals, and he's telling me all about his life as a Bombay Parsi in Shanghai. Uh, so you see, I mean, the, the links are, it's not far, we're not so far removed that the links are completely severed between the two cities. Uh, 
finally, this is the, you get these Art Deco movie palaces in Shanghai at that era to show Western movies. This one shows uh, MGM movies. It's built by Metro Goldwyn Mayer uh, Studios in Hollywood. It's called The Metro. Uh, it's built by an immigrant uh, Scottish architect based in New York who builds movie palaces mostly in the US, but took this commission uh, in Bombay as well. You can see this New York aesthetic and the, the verticality of the fin. You have the chandeliers that look like uh, glass Empire State Buildings hanging from the ceiling. Um, and then in the opening gala, uh, you have the MGM Lions. You have in code in the fine print that this is a cinema for all Bombay, meaning that it's not racially restricted. Uh, in the bottom left, you see a couple. The woman has, it's not clear exactly what it is, but some kind of religious headdress. She's about to attend the cinema. Uh, and not to argue that the be-all and end-all of cosmopolitan modernity is us all watching the same uh, lousy Hollywood movies, but just think of this city going from 1870, where the British are airlifting in uh, an Oxford or a Cambridge about 600 years after Oxford and Cambridge were created, and now the Hollywood studios are building Art Deco movie palaces exactly on schedule with what they're building in Los Angeles in this city. Uh, as you probably know a bit, uh, Bollywood films take this, you know, movies are founded in, in, in Paris and perfected in Los Angeles, these Western forms, and they create uh, uh, their own uh, Indian cinema. And this, this cinema itself reflects it. This is the last of the Art Deco movie palaces in Bombay. It opens in, it, in 1947, the, when upon Indian independence, the British architect who is designing this appropriately dies on a, in a plane crash on his trip to London and is replaced by an Indian architect who finishes the building. Uh, they name it the Liberty, and they, they make it the first uh, of the Bombay movie palaces that will only show Indian films, which it, which it does uh, to this day. Um, and on, it's, it, it's, it's built by a, a family of Muslim traders, who cotton traders, who did business with China and Japan, built their fortune, and then went into the movie business. And inside, you have this Art Deco Quran, uh, which just, I think, is, is emblematic of uh, Mumbai in this period, and sort of Mumbai cosmopolitanism more generally, which is, uh, you know, in Miami Beach, they don't have Art Deco Qurans, but if you're going to have Art Deco in Mumbai, you might as well integrate um, some of the traditions of the communities involved. And I asked the current owner, who's uh, the, the grandson of the founder, if he can read it, and he says, oh, no, of course not. Um, but th that said, the, the cinema opened on Parsi New Year, because that was a good time to sell tickets, uh, and just this sense of not really having to choose between being Muslim or being Indian. This seems, you know, Mumbai cosmopolitanism at its best, which is not to say that uh, in the slums, Hindus and Muslims don't, you know, every so often riot, but uh, it is a vision of, of, of Mumbai at its best. Mumbai was not meant to be uh, in the Cold War decades. Uh, we all know who the man on the right is. Do we know who the man on the left is? It's a trick question. Um, it's just young Gandhi and old Gandhi. Um, and you see uh, young Gandhi on the left uh, is dressed as an Edwardian dandy. He wanted to be a lawyer in Bombay, but the lawyers in Bombay were too good. He wasn't a good enough lawyer. He had to go to South Africa to get his legal practice started. Um, and while in South Africa encountering uh, the, the racism there, he becomes what the person we now think of as Gandhi. And in many ways, uh, at the right, you see him spinning his homespun cloth, uh, wearing just a simple loincloth. I see him as a lapsed convert to the, in the cult of the goddess of progress. His idea is that if India is going to be independent, it can't just mimic, it can't do the Willingdon Club, it can't just mimic British forms and staff all the institutions with Indians. It has to actually undo the, the British narrative of progress. Uh, you can imagine that uh, Bombay is not gonna do well uh, under this philosophy of uh, self-sufficiency, uh, which obviously gets at international trade um, and questioning of the growth model of capitalism, which gets at Bombay's bread and butter, which is the stock market. You can see here, this is an independence era ad. This is Sir Victor's Bombay Cousins Company. Uh, and in the fine print, it's, it's telling you to buy Indian cloth. And in the fine print, it says it's made of Indian yarn, of Indian labor by an Indian company. Um, now, if you're gonna have, if, if this criteria is what's the most Indian city in India, Bombay's gonna lose every time. Uh, if the, if the, in these national debates, very much similar to in, in China, when you have a, sort of a peasant-friendly regime, what's the, truest, what's the truest city to its peasant nature? Shanghai is never going to win that competition. So here you, you can sort of feel the defensive crouch that the city is going into. Um, and until, 
uh, about 1990, the city, uh, the, wet, the foreigners essentially leave. The economy is restricted. Um, Tata Airways, for example, becomes Air India's nationalized, um, etc. The rebirth. Uh, Shanghai's rebirth begins in 1990. Uh, much like Bombay was rewarded for its quiescence during the 1857 mutiny, Shanghai is rewarded for its quiescence during the Tiananmen Square massacre. Uh, very little happens in, in Shanghai uh, when all of that, uh, all the, the protests are taking place in, in Beijing. And as a result, the, city is, the city's uh, authorities are finally authorized uh, to develop. So in Pudong, directly across from the Bund, this was a, a district of warehouses and factories for companies like British American Tobacco and Standard Oil and, and filled with shanty towns. Uh, they build a new downtown, which includes more skyscrapers than New York City. Uh, incidentally, this shot I took a year ago. And um, the building with that skeleton at, at, the, at the bottom uh, and the two cranes uh, Mary Lou had drinks at the top of that uh, hotel uh, um, about a month, two months ago. So you get some sense uh, as well of the pace of development as well as the scale. Unfortunately, the, the responses so far uh, are, are not as creative as they were in the 30s. There's a real sense that uh, modernity is now branded as Western uh, and that, that the only way to be modern is, is, is through uh, living like a Westerner. Um, here these are, you can now live or, or shop in any of the concessions again. You have a, a mall shaped like the Pentagon. Um, here you have Fisher Island, which promises a beautiful life with verdant hills and green water, a free life from Miami of USA. But if you don't want to live in the American concession, you can live in the French. You have uh, the 16e arrondissement. Uh, and here you have a, a woman show, you know, with, with the French market culture in the, in the corner. Or, of course, British Manor. Uh, this is pure England, uh, graceful Shanghai, it's supposed to say. Uh, and, here I am in a, this is called Thames Town. This is a suburb of Shanghai uh, built to look like an English high street. Um, of course, in, you know, the population of these developments is 100% Chinese and the architecture is uh, ersatz Britain or France or America. In Mumbai too, you have a, a real estate boom. In 1991, the uh, federal government of India uh, was going to default on its loans and the IMF forced the market, forced free market reforms, uh, which has led to a massive boom in, in Mumbai, which is historically the main uh, financial hub of the country. And you see the high rises going up. Um, these two buildings, uh, which I got a tour of uh, in February, are named Imperial Towers. Uh, this is the most successful of the new developments in Mumbai, called Hiranandani Gardens. Uh, you might remember it from Slumdog Millionaire, where they have the scene where they look at each other and say, ooh, Mumbai is changing. It's, it's shot here, at, here in Indani Gardens. Uh, again, much like uh, Sir Gilbert Scott's uh, university building, the idea is that, that it has to be more Western than the West. Uh, this, is, um, this is what it looks like. This is a pizza hut in a Greek temple. Um, and I've lived in this country for my whole life, and I've never yet eaten at a pizza hut in a Greek temple. Uh, but this is the most successful development in Mumbai. Uh, I talked to the developer. His taste, let's say, has, has matured since he began building this, but he says he's trapped because this is what the market demands. And he keeps putting up these 30-story Greek temples and they keep filling up. So he feels like his hands are tied. Uh, the architect who I also interviewed um, seemed to feel completely vindicated by the market demand. That, that bringing any aesthetic or cultural criteria to this project to evaluate it was, was uh, was unfair, and uh, if you wanted to, to know its success, you could just look at the uh, spreadsheets of its rental rates. This is from this was view from one hill. Over the other hill is the slum that services uh, the, this housing and, and corporate office development. And again, as with the Charles, it does make you wonder how sustainable uh, this model of development uh, is going to be. Similarly, in Shanghai, this is a man riding his. Uh, rickshaw wheelbarrow contraption with uh, bamboo construction materials through the French concession, which you can see from the sycamore tree next to a late model minivan. Uh, that said, both the Indian and Chinese governments have some sense that the distance between both between these cities and the countryside, um, as well as the distance, social distance within these cities is an issue. The Chinese Communist Party has its, its current slogan program is the harmonious society which tries to deal with some of these tensions. Uh, in 2004, the uh, BJP party was voted out of office in India uh, when their 
slogan of India shining did not jive with the reality for most Indian voters. So th these, these issues have been raised again. Uh, how the individual relates to the metropolis is, is, is still an open question. This is Century Park, built in Pudong in honor of, in, in, open to 2000 in honor of the Asian century. Um, how this will all turn out is, 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 of course, very difficult to know. But the fact that the history of the century will be written in cities like these, I think, is indisputable. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.